And I think that um, all of us, and just as a historian, when we look at a lot of these sites, we really want to look at uh, and ask the following questions. The first one is, how do the stories that we tell about women's activism actively erase the racialized nature of 19th century abolition and reform, right? How is a, a public space actively doing that? It's not as if the person who created the space is just forgot or didn't know. It's particularly 2018, how is it actively erasing that? Is the feminist history road trip, FemTor, seeks to identify and explore sites and places connected to women's history in regions all across the US FemTor defines women's history sites as places where events relevant to the history of gender in America occurred, particularly sites connected to the participants uh, and history of women of color, working class women, queer women, and women often overlooked in women's studies. Recognizing that women's history is not monolithic and that the experience of gender relies as much on a woman's race and class as it does on a woman's perceived sex. Femtor seeks uncomfortable stories, stories that do not fit into a neat narrative, and stories that raise as many questions as they do answers. So please join me in welcoming the Greenwich Sisters and the Femtor. So I'm Kirsten Greenwich, um, and these are my sisters. I'm Carrie Greenwich. So I'm, I'm, Ka I'm Caitlin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought we'd uh, begin just by introducing uh, each of ourselves and what we do, and, and then we'll take it through from there. So I'm Kirsten, I'm a playwright, I'm also an educator. Um, I teach at Boston University, and I also am on staff at Company One Theater, where I am a Mellon uh, Fellow, uh, Howl Around Playwright in Residence. Um, and I would also like to say that um, Mellon uh, also funds Femtor uh, uh, as well. And um, I don't want to take up too much time in terms of what I do, so I will, I will just you know, pass, the, pass the ball down to my sisters. Carrie, what do you do? <laughs> I teach at Tufts University. I'm laughing because it's like we're like little kids and Kirsten as the oldest would like tell us what to say on the stage. <laughs> um, so my name is Carrie Greenwich. I am a historian. Um, my area of focus is late 19th and early 20th century African American history and African diasporic history and literature. Um, I currently teach at Tufts where I'm the uh, director of the American Studies program uh, through the Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora Department. Um, and I'm co-director of the African American Trail Project at um, the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at Tufts. Oh. Um, and I'm Caitlin Greenidge. I'm a fiction writer, so uh, my first novel called We Love You, Charlie Freeman came out in 2016. Um, I'm currently at work on my second novel. I also am a columnist for the New York Times, the Sunday Review, um, and I am currently a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute where I'm working on my second novel, and in the spring I'll be a fellow at uh, Princeton's uh, Hotter Arts Center. So I'm going to start us off by talking about um, the origins of FemTor and where it came from. And basically, uh, FemTor is a long time in the making. Years ago, um, as, oh my gosh, that's me. Um, <laughs> uh, when I would go to cocktail parties and I would say I was a playwright, and people would say, oh, you're a playwright, you're a writer. Um, I have so many stories I'd like to talk to you about. And they'd tell me all these stories and then they'd want me to write about them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would say, oh, that's really wonderful. I think you should write about them. Um, and there'd be, we'd volley back and forth. And what that made me realize is that people have a lot of stories. Usually these stories are about women um, because uh, my focus is, uh, as a playwright, my mission as a playwright is to write stories about women, um, women of color, underrepresented people, and put them on stage. And so uh, people would often have these stories like at the ready and say, I would love for you to write this story. And oftentimes there are women that they knew in their family, um, aunts, grandmothers, um, uh, people that they felt had not had a voice when they were alive and that they felt like I would give voice, great voice to. And, um, and often try and turn it around and say, I have a lot of stories that I have to do. 
myself, and I would love you to write these. Um, but what I really thought would be great is if I could find some sort of way to have this bank um, to uh, collect these stories for people that I was coming in contact to, contact with, and for myself, um, and maybe uh, begin to start to like have a little um, uh, catalog of them. And I knew that I couldn't do this by myself, so I thought, how would I be able to fund this? So I began writing um, grants or applying to grants. And I'm not a historian. My sister is a historian. <laughs> at the time, my other sister um, worked at Weeksville. Uh, and so she is, all, and, and Caitlin and I were both um, history majors in college at the same college. I found out later that Caitlin was a far better historian than I was because our, we had the same professors and they were putting her forward for all these awards that they never, <laughs> <laughs> they never put me forward for. So she was pretty good. Um, uh, but I was applying for all these things and I wasn't getting them because the, the idea was very scattershot, um, very unfocused. And I'm a playwright, so my life's work is to write plays. It is not to do this type of the thing that I had no idea how to, how to put into um, cohesive language. So it went on for many years until I got this Mellon grant um, with Company One. Uh -huh. And Mellon is fabulous for many reasons. One, I'm on staff at a theater company that I respect highly, but also they give you funds to do these projects that they um, uh, uh, think that playwrights sh should, that are, anything that you want to do, that you've been trying to do for a long time, they say go do it, which is a huge gift. So you don't have to have, try to articulate. You can be like, hey, I just want to do this thing. So about two years ago, um, Caitlin and Carrie said, what are you doing for the summer? And I said, I'm going on a road trip. And I think I'm taking my kids, <laughs> and I'm just going to go and, re and find these historical sites. So I love house tours. And I'm going to take my kids, and I'm going to go to house tours that um, focus or have a, are women-centered. And I'm going to try to put this idea, formulate this idea. And I think we were in my kitchen. Our ki well, OK. We it's all live together. She, we all live together. It's not my kitchen. It's in our kitchen. Live, we, all live, we, all, we live together in Westboro. Um, and uh, both of them said, we want to go too. And that was how FemTour was born. And um, that first tour, we, we knew, OK, we knew enough and we're intellectual, we're intellectual enough to know that we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> and that this tour was a fact-finding tour and that we needed to start small. So we were going to start in New England. Um, and we were going to uh, pick sites that uh, some of the sites we knew a little bit about. So one of the sites we started with was, uh, was the Royal House in, uh, Slave Quarter Museum. I'm already writing a play about uh, the enslaved woman who lived at that, at that site many years ago, Belinda Sutton. Um, we chose the uh, Prudence Crandall Museum. Uh, Carrie has uh, uh, really already had a relationship with that uh, museum. We chose the Pequot Museum because we, uh, wanted, to, we wanted to choose a museum that had um, a history of Native women, Indigenous women. Um, and then we also, well, we chose Emily Dickinson. I chose that one. That was for me. <laughs> that um, was fun, though. Was like that, 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 was, that ended up being fun. Um, and what else, what was, else was on that first tour? Um, the Louisa May Alcott house, you guys went to. The Louisa May Alcott was on that, was, was planned. We, we also were learning how to work together. So my plan was like four houses a day, four sites a day. We're going to stuff everything in. My kids are going to love it. <laughs> they didn't really love it. Yeah, that notice, notice that they're not here because it's um, the <laughs> They're not here, as you can see. Um, we're going to do four sites a day. And um, uh, it was Caitlin who was a little more tempered and was saying maybe not four Much sites Much smarter than, than us because we, we would have gone to like six sites and I'm a history nerd, so I would have gone to multiple uh, sites. I'm a playwright. I don't. I, I avoided having a real job for a long time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I learned while I was at Company One are. is how to have meetings and how to hold business <laughs> meetings. <laughs> They're laughing over there. So um, we also. What I also was able to build into a day is how to structure our days and how to have meetings and always have check-in meetings. And and I can also now hand it over to Caitlin and um, talk about how our tour. We're also going to go into these tours when Caitlin, Carrie does the historical context about what we actually saw on those tours. Our tours, we came back from those tours, and then our focus began to shift. 
because what we learned is how we wanted to shape our next tour and what we wanted the content of our, our body work to actually be after that summer. Caitlin, take it away. Um, yeah, so when we sort of, after that fact-finding first year, we sort of talked a little bit, of, a bit more about what worked and what didn't. Um, and one of the things that came up was this idea, I think all three of us have had this experience um, when you're writing about a uh, piece of, uh, particularly history belonging to marginalized people, um, oftentimes what happens when you're either presenting or talking about those his that history is because it's untalked about or because it's something um, people feel is sort of hidden or kept from them, um, oftentimes people can get really um, contentious, understandably, about what they believe you have or haven't, quote unquote, left out. Um, and so if you go in and you call your project FemTor and it's all of women's history, um, you know, people have very different expectations of who's supposed to be in and who is supposed to be out. Um, or even just who's supposed to be in, maybe not even people are trying to exclude, just making sure that everyone is included. But we're only three people. As you hear, we have many other jobs, so <laughs> we cannot do the whole history of all women in America from, you know, prehistory to today. Um, in a single tour. So we were trying to think about what's a, what is a more sort of um, concentrated way to think about this, to get at the things that all three of us are interested in in our, um, in our work and all three of us have talked about differently in our work. Um, and so this was for summer 2018. Um, and for me at the time I was, you know, if, if summer 2018 was right before the midterm elections. Um, there was sort of this political slogan that was uh, bubbling up out of social media and became sort of this political slogan that people kept saying, which was like, trust black women, vote like a black woman, black women are so wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I, you know, that was a really interesting slogan and statement to me that um, people were rallying around, uh, even as we sort of, that same summer, all these statistics were coming out about uh, black maternal health, um, you know, about how, uh, you know, black women are literally dying, giving birth in this country. Um, so clearly, you know, we have an ideal of, uh, you know, trust black women, black women can be our political mentors, but in terms of actually valuing black women's mm -hmm. lives materially, we have a long way to go. Um, so I'm, sort of more interested in exploring that tension and that tension and that expectation that comes from saying, uh, you know, trust black women, they are these sort of uh, political avatars um, and the expectations that are put around um, that uh, role, uh, which is often to um, both be sort of like a, you know, this is, this is kind of a black women gender theory 101, but to be sort of like a superwoman for everybody um, and to sort of ignore the complications, the interior life, um, the, uh, all the sorts of things that um, make us actually human. Um, so we decided to maybe focus a little bit more um, and to focus on sort of uh, the history of, of women of color um, and also to recognize that um, e even though we want to, this is a place-based history. So just in terms of um, our time, our ability to travel, the sites that we can, that we physically can get to, are limited um, because we don't have endless amounts of time to travel sort of all over the country. So um, we were trying to think of what sort of models can we use for this tour to both focus on the things that we actually want to talk about, and then also invite other people into the conversation who have knowledge of places, people that we don't know about, maybe other regions of the country, and make this more of a conversation about um, women's history sites and less sort of you know, you left out so-and-so, how could you leave out so-and-so, blah, 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 kind of thing that um, sometimes like, happens. Yeah, that confrontational. Confr thing. That sometimes happens, which is understandable because a lot of times when um, uh, trail sites or things are made, uh, it can feel a lot, I don't know if these are oftentimes the creator's intentions, but it can feel a lot as if these are documents that um, are definitive or um, documents that are not open to discussion. So we, we're trying to think of a way, how can we make this tour both about you know, about what we want to talk about, but then also open to discussion, open to, to um, conversation. Um, our second year, we decided to go to um, some of the sort of cornerstone women histories, women's history sites, in part to be able to talk to people when they say, if we um, decide not to include Seneca Falls, how come Seneca Falls isn't on your list? We can say, well, we went there, and um, these are the reasons why, and these are the reasons not, and um, you can put Seneca Falls on your list, but this maybe will not be on ours. So um, 
We, uh, we went to, last summer we went to um, Seneca Falls. We also went to um, uh, the New Bedford Women's Walking Tour, which is a brand new walking tour. It's fantastic, definitely. Wonderful, um, wonderful. Re recommend that you go. Uh, it is, it covers uh, two centuries, right? Yep. Of um, New Bedford Women's History. Um, really fascinating if you can make it um, there. Definitely, definitely stress to go, as well as to um, Seneca Falls, which is a national historic site. Um, Seneca Falls is also near um, Harriet Tubman's grave site and the brand new Harriet Tubman National Historic Park. Um, so we uh, went to both the grave site and the, and the park. And um, Kerry and Kirsten went to the Boston Women's Walking Tour. I unfortunately wasn't, I don't actually live in Boston, I live in New York, so um, I wasn't actually able to get to some of the uh, sites. He got away. And Elizabeth Katie Stanton. Hmm? Elizabeth Katie Oh, yes, and Elizabeth Katie Stanton's house. Um, so, you know, um, there's a, there has been more recently, I think in the last year, like um, uh, Brent Staples in the New York Times, who just won the Pulitzer, he did that. Mm -hmm. He's been doing these really um, great uh, columns on um, history columns, and so he did that column that came out, I think, this fall. Yeah about um, the uh, women's suffrage movement and race and sort of that division that happened um, in the 19th century that continued into the 20th century. Um, and uh, we definitely saw sort of remnants of that when we were in Seneca Falls and um, beginning to think about how do we interpret that history, honor these places that, um, uh, ex you know, that exist now that people have put in a lot of, of, of effort into preserve and then also hopefully look for additional places of um, maybe uh, people who we don't know as much about but who were part of these um, movements moving forward. Um, I spoke with a, a, a producer at WNYC, which is the public radio station in New York, uh, producer Rebecca Carroll. She does a series um, on race for uh, them that you can actually listen to online. She's a fantastic producer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I met with her and sort of said, you know, if we did this as a podcast, what should we do? And she's just sort of talking about um, uh, focusing around certain questions. Um, I think we came up with the idea of a podcast because it was uh, a medium that none of us have ever worked in before. None of us have worked in audio before. Um, so we're, it's all new ground for each of us. We're learning um, a new skill. Um, and as you can probably tell, we, it's all very strong personalities here. So if we can level the playing field where everybody is in a new space where they don't really understand what's going on yet, um, we can hopefully yes. have sort of interesting interactions with each other, um, <laughs> less so than if we said this is definitely going to be you know, a historical book, which is Carrie's territory, or a play, which is Kirsten's territory, or, um, a, you novel. Know, or a novel, which is um, my territory. So, um, so I, I was really excited about the chance to um, try this new medium um, and uh, to try uh, and to figure out how we would translate some of these ideas um, into that space. So I was at Radcliffe. Um, I've been at Radcliffe this fall. Uh, Radcliffe, as is, is, you can probably imagine, is a really generous program. Um, and uh, they, one of the benefits of being there is that you have a research partner, which is a um, Harvard undergrad student, to work with you oh, they were wonderful. on your research. So we had um, two uh, Harvard undergrads, Jenna Gray and uh, Larissa um, Ols Olwison, I think is how you pronounce Olwison. her last name. Um, they worked with us for, excuse me, for the fall semester um, in recording sort of like a preliminary sketch of what maybe a podcast episode would look like. Um, and we decided to do it at first just to sort of jog ourselves and to jog um, just general conversation between ourselves. We decided to do it around a well-known figure, someone um, who, a black woman historical figure that is well-known, uh, but whose story is um, oftentimes misinterpreted. So um, we did it around, we did one recording around Harriet Tubman and we did one recording around Sojourner Truth. Um, and uh, we worked with a freelance um, audio producer that I know in New York to um, produce a sizzle reel. Uh, and um, we're hopefully going to try and see if we can find um, more experienced producers to help us make a full episode and, to, and, and kind of figure out what that will look like.
It was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh my god, it was so much fun. But I feel I feel bad for the producers because no, why? because we were like talking over each other, and then I thought it was too much on me, which is why I'm being more quiet. You did talk a lot. I did talk a lot in that one. <laughs> so I was I just like kind of be a little stayed, but I, I it was awesome. But I felt they had to like edit out a lot of our stuff. That's the banter, they, that's the inappropriate that's jokes. That's the whole point. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. It was a lot of it was, it was a lot. It was, of fun. was a lot of fun though. It yes. was a lot of fun. Um, uh, but. Uh, to echo what Caitlin, I just almost called you Katya, which is my daughter's name. Which, to echo what um, Caitlin said, the, the, the one huge important um, decision in choosing that medium, which is what is taking, I think, a long time in us working that medium, is that none of us have any experience in it. Um, uh, I did, I mean, I did write a script, which is, which is, I'm, I'm <laughs> which was hilarious. And nobody followed it. Yeah. And I was just like, what? This is not like when we were five years old. No one's following my direction. So it's it's actually um, really it's it's been really wonderful to work with, with each other as adults. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And the fem and traveling with each other as adults too. Yes. So one thing I think that that solidified us needing to shift and take that approach, especially the soup, the black woman as superhero, and interrogating that. Um, and I, I we haven't used the word the word avatar yet, but I like that. When we when we took this tour of upstate New York, traveling to see these women and being, I think three relatively strong, feeling strong women, um, and traveling in upstate New York and feeling the the trepidation of being three black women traveling alone with a child, um, and uh, being in in an unknown world, so I I, I drive a lot. Well, you're, you're, you're being so very kind I'm by not saying kind. that well, there were. No, it, it, I, I will give a historical context. So um, Seneca Falls is really close to Auburn, New York, and Auburn, yeah. New York holds Auburn Prison, which yeah. is one of the oldest um, prisons in the United States. It's also sort of the epicenter of um, you know uh, our current mass issues around mass incarceration. I mean, that was happening in Auburn prison in like the 1840s as soon as mm. slavery ended up there. Most of the uh, formerly enslaved people ended up in that prison. That prison is where um, most of the uh, members of New York City's Black Panther Party mm -hmm. ended up being imprisoned. And while they were there, um, the KKK decided to infiltrate the prison guards of that, system, of that prison. Um, so there's a lot of Confederate flags up there. Um, there's just it is a very tense place to be as a woman of color, sort of walking through. And it was it was tense <clears> just <throat> with my niece Kirsten's daughter, who's like who's 11, and she's our wonderful photographer. So she takes wonderful photographs, um, some of which are are up here are, are hers. And being with her and seeing all the Confederate flags. Um, even as it's a place that, as a historian, is this supposedly burnt over district that you know is the birth of radical white evangelical abolition in the 19th century, but then you have Auburn Prison there, and then you have this active erasure um, of the black, little pockets of black communities that did live in that area during the 19th century, and not a lot of commemoration of those communities, even though there now is the Harriet Tubman uh, National Historical Park there. Um, it definitely, if you, if you drove driving through there, the Confederate flags, Auburn Prison, it would definitely feel like a white space in a way that, as a historian, to me, didn't ring true. Um, and seemed like it was a very active erasing of the history that actually I know to be there, and Caitlin knows to be there, and you would know to, you would know to be in that space. Yeah. So, it was, yeah. So it was an interesting, um, sometimes, sometimes you, I know that I, as an artist, have these moments of like, why do I do what I do, and should I keep doing it? And it definitely felt like, Yes, this is this is why I do what I do. I definitely should keep doing it, and doing it in this form. Um, yeah. So I think it's a good time for maybe Carrie to show us some of the things that we saw in yes. 2017, 2018. Yeah. So I I begin my poor students. I love to begin with quotes, and I begin with that, which I think encapsulates what Caitlin was saying about. Um, the various ways in which stories are told, people becoming very defensive about how you're telling certain stories, and then also this notion that um, black women in particular become this symbol, um, particularly 2018, black women are gonna save us, right? And then, um, you know, 
it becomes a hashtag, black girl magic becomes a hashtag, um, but there's nothing really around it. So Nell Irvin Painter, wonderful black woman historian, beyond even the most finely tuned categories lies something exceeding race, class, and gender, individual subjectivity. And I think that um, all of us, and just as a historian, when we look at a lot of these sites, we really want to look at uh, and ask the following questions. The first one is, how do the stories that we tell about women's activism actively erase the racialized nature of 19th century abolition and reform, right? How is a, a public space actively doing that? It's not as if the person who created the space is just forgot or didn't know. It's particularly 2018, how is it actively erasing that? And so one of the things um, that we mentioned were sites we visited that we noticed were not doing that and made a, a wholehearted effort in how they're set up and in their wonderful interpreters, in their wonderful just approach to us when we arrived of how it is that they're trying to not erase. And one of those places was um, when we got to Seneca Falls was that um, the center itself seemed like a space that um, um, was just beginning to, to look at the role of African Americans, but we had a wonderful tour guide who was a young woman who um, gave us a tour of the site and was very cognizant of the fact that the site was just beginning to um, uncover stories of the role of African Americans and Frederick Douglass and the role of African American people. So that's the Elizabeth Cady Stanton site. Another site that did this in terms of this idea of trying to get uh, to not actively erase was, as Carson mentioned before, this lovely tour, for those of you who are local, um, in New Bedford. Um, they covered you know, a wide, diverse group of women, uh, black women, native women, multiracial women, um, and cover you know, two centuries of history. It was a community affair, so when we went, they were having a whole community day, so you didn't just have stodgy historians, uh, you didn't just have donors there, you had people from the community who were you know, doing drumming and playing there and you know, trying to actively say this is a place that isn't going to erase the history that we have, it's embracing the history. Um, seeing the grave site of someone like a Harriet Tubman in Auburn, New York, one of the things we, uh, we noticed, and I noticed as a historian, um, is, is, is the fact that um, these communities, particularly Auburn, had black communities that existed in them in the 19th century. And when we went there, we saw Harriet Tubman's house, but we also saw her gravesite at the, at the cemetery there along with her, her relatives. Um, and so one of the things that was, that was most um, interesting about that was how Harriet Tubman's commemoration within Auburn um, can sort of start to replace a lot of the erasure that has taken place in, in certain places. The other museum we visited is the Prudence Crandall Museum um, in uh, Canterbury, Connecticut. And one of the things we asked about that museum, if we're looking at ideas of erasure, what stories are told and what stories are not told. And again, one of the things we loved about that site was that the interpreters at that site uh, were very much trying to tell the story, not just of Prudence Crandall, but also of the African-American uh, young women who attended the, um, the, the school. So just to give a little bit of a background, Prudence Crandall is the focus of this museum and its history, the story of the black women who supported Crandall's Canterbury School and furthered the cause of black women's educational possibility are obscured by the emphasis on women's rights as white and abolitionism as a project motivated by white benevolence. The inclusion of Crandall's black student, Sarah Harris Fair Fairweather, provides a counterpoint to the white narrative of the Canterbury School. So Prudence Crandall, just a little bit of background, was a uh, Quaker woman born in Rhode Island. She moves eventually to Connecticut, where she founded a female academy in Canterbury in 1831. The academy was um, revolutionary for the, its time because it educated women, white women, um, in what was called the gentleman's course at the time. Um, by 1832, an African-American young woman named uh, Elizabeth Fairweather writes to Prudence Crandall uh, asking if she can attend the school with the goal of teaching fellow African-Americans um, in Connecticut, and Prudence Crandall admits her. Uh, it has caused a huge controversy in Canterbury and the surrounding areas. White families 
withdrew their white students from the school. Uh, the town met and they eventually had a meeting where they um, passed a law that was uh, a black law in the state of Connecticut that said you could not teach uh, students from out of state. Um, Prudence Crandall was tried. The first trial was a hung jury. The second trial, um, she was convicted, but it was overturned. Um, and in the meantime, she's still running the school that became sort of an all-black women's school. Uh, by the early 1830s, 1832, the school is uh, forced to close down after white mobs attack the building. And Prudence Crandall feared for the safety of her black female students, and so she closed it down. And so in that story, we get an image of Prudence Crandall, right, as this white woman who nobly is um, pushing the cause of abolition and women's rights. And one of the things that we noticed at the museum was that many of the, the docents or the interpreters there are trying to actively um, remember and commemorate the African American experience that existed at that site. Um, the inclusion of Crandall's black student, Sarah Harris, um, Harris's story is interpreted at the Crandall Museum by tour guides and exhibits. The public perception of Harris's impact are just beginning to earn the respect that it deserves. This is what FemTor aims to do, popularize, dissect, and complicate narratives of womanhood and feminism that have obscured the nuances of race, class, and color. Um, to give an idea of this, so this is a very famous children's book that I actually read when I was in third grade um, that was about Prudence Crandall. Um, and the woman who, who wrote a series of books, she is known, was known as sort of a feminist uh, children's writer. Um, and all of her books, um, you know, you read them, but they kind of actively erase the stories of the, of the African and African descended people. Um, we I would say that that museum did a really good, really job, good job at interpreting t to children. Yes. So it was about 100 degrees in that museum. Yes. And we had a, a eight year old and a 10 year old. Um, Who had been dragged to all these places. Fourth of July weekend. And it was the, our second museum. And by then they had realized what was happening. Um, <laughs> so it was no longer fun. <laughs> no, it was no longer fun. Um, and the, our interpreter uh, uh, was really wonderful with them and was able to interpret both to us and to the kids at the same time, which was really important um, to make it uh, uh, palatable to, to, to intergenerational. And, and right. if you're going to do a tour that is trying to get rid of the erasure, I thought they did a, they, they did a, a wonderful job because they were telling um, the stories of Elizabeth Harris. They were telling what they didn't know and what they were trying to discover, which I think is a, pro a powerful thing when you go to public places and the docent says, you know, we don't know this history, we're trying to research it, but this is what we, we do know. So they did a, a, a wonderful job of that. This is the Fairweather House. We did not go here, but this is the House of the Black Family um, that is a museum um, as well. The other thing we had questions about when we went to sites, this is the site of the Robbins House, which is located in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and looking at that house, one of the questions we came up with was, how do the stories that we tell about black women in 19th century America actively erase the diverse ways in which women of African descent lived with and negotiated the anti-black politics of their time, right? So how do we look at places that do interpret black history? Uh, what is, is missing on the story that you tell about black people, particularly black women? And the Robbins House does a fabulous job of interpreting the history of the uh, Robbins family, which was a family of African Americans who moved to Concord right after the Revolutionary War. Uh, Caesar Robbins was sort of the family patriarch. We believe he fought in the uh, Revolutionary War and received his freedom for fighting in that war. And he and his family settled in, um, in Concord and lived there up through the 1850s. So from roughly the 1780s to the 1850s, they're a fabulous museum. Um, Maria Madison is one of the directors of that museum um, in Concord. And one of the houses, one of the lives that is interpreted there is the life of Ellen Garrison Jackson. She was uh, the granddaughter of Caesar uh, Robbins. During the Civil War, she um, went to the South to teach um, African-American newly freed slaves in Virginia and in Maryland. She got her start, however, in Concord, where she uh, was one of the only black students in the Concord Public Schools. Um, her mother was a member of the Concord uh, Women's female anti-slavery society, and eventually Ellen Garrison made, made her way to Maryland where she became the first woman to sue on behalf of the uh, first Civil Rights Act that was passed in 1866. So one of the things we looked at at this site was how does that become a story that 
contradict stories that were told about black womanhood um, in terms of enslavement, in terms of black women having sort of lack of political um, participation before you know, the 1920s, of black women being Southern, um, of black women being um, needing sort of to, um, coming from, if they're in the North, coming from urban spaces, right, and having to negotiate that. The other things we looked at, this is my favorite one, um, and this was one of the ones we did the podcast on, or the, the draft for the podcast on, is Sojourner Truth. And one of the questions we had looking at her was, how do the iconic stories, and this is what Caitlin was talking about, how do the iconic stories that we tell about black racial exceptionalism, embodying the term black girl magic, or um, black women will save us, how do these iconic stories obscure the complicated nuances of gendered and racialized lives? So we looked at Sojourner Truth, who people probably know, and as a young kid, you learn about Sojourner Truth and her Ain't I a Woman speech, which becomes this rallying cry. And one of the things when we did the podcast that we looked at was the fact that what is it about Sojourner Truth that is this invention um, and that we still believe of as an invention? So Sojourner Truth was born in upstate New York. She was enslaved in New York. She was not enslaved in the South. She was enslaved in New York up until the 1820s. <laughs> Um, before she becomes this iconic feminist, um, she sort of has this life of a lot of traumas that we would now call, and it's kind of the trendy wor word that we would have for it. Um, she um, is sexually uh, abused by a slave mistress um, in upstate New York. She has a child who is sold into slavery illegally in Alabama and then sues and becomes the first black woman to successfully sue um, to get her son back in the 1840s. That son came back and was completely traumatized and then eventually disappeared from her life. We know that before she becomes Sojourner Truth, um, she joins um, various uh, religious um, evangelical movements, the Millerites in upstate New York, and um, then finds her way to Michigan where she, or Ohio where she gives her famous Ain't Day a Woman speech that um, is not actually the speech that we all think of, right? It was not recorded at the time she gave it. She gave an impromptu speech. Everyone loved the speech in 1851. It's eight years later that a white woman records the speech and prints it in a newspaper, right, and records it with the southern inflections of stereotypical black voice. We know that Sojourner Truth spoke Dutch until she was eight years old, so English was her second language. We know that she spoke with a Dutch accent. This is something that she, you know, people commented on. And so the fact that she's this invention, the story that we have of Sojourner Truth, that she speaks in this inflected way, that she talks about, at one point in the late 19th century, the myth was that she had 16 children and they were all sold away. You know, completely um, a story that doesn't exist. And so one of our uh, femtor, what we would seek to do is, how do the stories that we even believe are affirmative stories? obscure the complicated lives and complicated realities of blackness and of womanhood. Um, Seneca Falls again, right? Um, as Caitlin was alluding to, right? This, this idea of the stories that we want to tell and the stories we seek out are not gonna be the stories that are the ones that um, Seneca Falls, 1848, and then you know Women's Right to Vote, 1920, and then um, the Civil Rights uh, Act and Women's Rights Act of 1964. We're really looking for stories that complicate those stories that have become the narrative we tell about women. Um, and other stories, right, we would encourage other people to tell um, because we wouldn't, we wouldn't we, that's not sort of what we're focusing on. Finally, uh, this is Harriet Tubman. And looking at her, one of the questions we had was, um, the most well-known and iconic figure of black womanhood, Tubman, born Ar Armintha Ross, was enslaved in Maryland, returned multiple times to rescue enslaved people along the Chesapeake, and conducted the infamous raid at Combahee Ferry in Colton, South Carolina in 1863. This raid freed over 700 enslaved men, women, and children with the help of Union Army leaders. Um, during our trip to Auburn, New York, however, we saw her gravesite and homestead, and Tubman's radical life was obscured by a multitude of Confederate flags and the deindustrialized remnants of an upstate New York countryside far removed from its reputation for 19th century burnt over district reform. And so one of the things we notice is that Harriet Tubman is often sanitized as being, you know, she just went back and rescued her children and then came back, and, you know, there's even the story she was hit in the head with a brick, and that's why she saw, you know, 
visions, you know, that's the story you're told as a child. And what does that obscure about her real radicalism, the fact that, you know, she's conducting raids on Confederate forces, that she's rescuing family members, that she's bringing them uh, first to Philadelphia and then settling in Auburn where, you know, all of them are buried and all of them remained up until she died, that her son uh, became uh, a political officer in Liberia, right? That she has this long sort of spanning life that goes against the, the popular iconic images that we have. So. Um, as we look at Femtor, and this is the visitor center that we went to um, that is now in Auburn, New York, um, recently opened um, and interprets her life. That's us with Kirsten's daughter at the Harriet Tubman site, uh, grave site. I hate, I hate this picture just because we look, I, don't, I think we look weird. Like. <laughs> I look like crazy, like was, it was so I'll, hot. I'll say, so this, was, this was not taken by Katya. This was taken by um, a gentleman who uh, yes. said, can I take your picture? We believe he was a historian at a, another university um, that Kerry recognized from his jack, book jacket cover. Yes. So, but then I was too but afraid to be like away, a droopy. And, and we were away, like, so. we think we know you. It was, that's why we look weird. Yes, we like, because I, that's why I probably looked shocked because um, I'm a history nerd, so I was like, oh my God, like, it's, it's historian? you. Historian? Yes. Oh, goodbye. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why we look at So this is, um, this is to say that the Frem Tor uh, seeks to tell the stories that are known and that are, that are unknown. Um, we are not here to answer all questions for all women. We have a specific way that we look at history and the stories that we want to tell each of us using our various um, field of expertise to do that. Uh, we don't have all the answers in terms of fem feminism and race and gender and, um, and all of those, what those complicated ideas entail, but uh, femtor is a way that we can begin to ask the questions uh, that are often not asked when we look at feminism um, in terms of how it's popularly understood or black women as they are popularly understood. You focus on 19th century. Are you doing 20th century we have, right now we're focusing on the podcast and we have four, I think about four um, episodes that we're, we're, we're focusing on. So we're focusing on those four like figures, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, um, the, fir the only black family to be on the Titanic. And um, uh, can you, one of you describe okay. the Philadelphia black female circles? So, oh, Sarah Maps Douglas? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah uh, we were talking about um, including uh, since it is easy for all of us to get to this particular um, site, uh, was to talk about the free black community in Philadelphia, um, and particularly uh, Sarah Maps Douglas, who was a part of the um, I think, uh, Philadelphia. Female Literature Society, mm -hmm. um, who is interesting to, I think, us in particular, um, because she writes about her sort of radicalization um, of understanding, of, of coming to the anti-slavery cause. Um, and, I, and as a free black woman in Philadelphia, having to learn to identify with enslaved black people in other states. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, that part of the way that she figured out how to do that was through like these proto writing workshops. Mm -hmm. um, so they, uh, black women activists would get together, they would write these um, poems uh, uh, and, and uh, pieces around abolition, put them all in a box and then anonymously read them out loud and critique them. Very first writing workshop in America, possibly, who knows? But, um, I mean, this is, we have to think this yeah, is like the 1830s, that's, 1840s. Yeah, that's just a writing workshop joke, but um, they, <laughs> They, so that's super, super fascinating that these women are, um, are, are affirming both their own interiority and their own um, uh, intellectual and uh, political development. Um, I think a lot of times when we talk about uh, black women political figures, the assumption that they came to this radicalism somehow naturally, quote yes. unquote, or without study, is um, one that's just, just sort of a given. But in fact, you know, it, it, when you live within a uh, slave society, it is a radical act of imagination to imagine that freedom is possible for everybody. Um, and that took dedicated work and study and intellectual work. And, um, ar and arguments. I mean, and, and arguments. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we want to talk about that site is to talk about um, that actual work that went into it. Um, instead of sort of just um, assuming that you know somehow people were moral or better creatures just because of their subjectivity. One of the things that we really got with it, we've been talking about over the last um, two years, 18 months, is what activism looks like um, today, and the myth that um, 
that it, the, of the soul activist and um, what it, and how community um, aids activism. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is where that idea comes from. Um, and so it, a, a podcast, a, a, how we're building that podcast is to look at that and then um, have conversations about, about present day life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and to, to answer your question, you know, I, I think where we really follow what the stories are that interest us in terms of um, popular narratives that are told versus the reality that we know exists and then the stories that tell that reality. So after we do, you know, the next couple of episodes or podcasts, we'll probably find something in the 20th century um, that is, is one of those stories. But really, I mean, the, the Sarah Maps Douglas is fascinating because, again, as Kirsten was saying, people have this perception that activism comes out of like just you getting the spirit and you're suddenly saying, I want to I wanna fight for my rights, right? Um, and really, you know, histor history would say that it's a lot of this conversation and it's reading and it's studying and it's saying that I thought this way in, you know, 1831, as Sarah Mapps would say, and by 1841, after talking to my community and debating and losing friendships and gaining friendships, I now believe this way. And that's how people, um, people uh, and communities become activists. And, you know, particularly in, in this climate, it's kind of like you're woke or you're not. Right, um, you're doing it or you're not, right? Um, and a lot of that, and, and part of it just has to do with you know the times we're in. But it's you know that that getting a more complete picture of how that might develop. Um, yeah, and I would just also say that one of the things that makes the podcast exciting is being able to respond to what myths the culture is throwing up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are uh, culture and conversations move at such a quick speed mm -hmm. now. Um, that being able to work in this format as opposed to in a book or a production or, um, or uh, even a published piece um, means that you can respond to sort of the different things that are um, kind of bubbling up really quickly. First of all, I want to thank you three sisters for the work that you're doing. And I'm always excited to hear women, talk, women particularly you women, uh, talking about black feminist agency. We don't hear enough of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned something about uh, Sojourner Truth that I didn't know. And it makes so much sense mm -hmm. that up in that county, in that Dutch county, her first language would certainly be Dutch. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. I, I love the fact that you're doing a podcast and there's a particular woman that of, of interest to me. I, I do the uh, detour. Uh, the Boston Detour African American Heritage Trail. So that's like you go from one spot and you hear my voice say, and this is blah de blah. So, mm -hmm. so one of the blah de blahs that is still a mystery to me is Mariah Stewart. Mm -hmm. and, the, oh, yeah. and, and, and I hope that you'll do some work with her once you finish with, your, with the women that you're, that you're looking at. So my question is if, that if, you, if you do her, I want to know what pushed her off the North Slope. She was the first, as for folks who don't know, the first woman to do public speaking and, and wrote a plethora of material. Mm -hmm. But she was very active and, and certainly uh, an activist. But all of a sudden, poof, she disappears. We know that David Walker was killed. We mm -hmm. know that her husband dies. Um, there's a placard if you go up on the North Slope of Beacon Hill on Joy Street where she lived and David Walker lived right next to her. But, it's, but there's a mystery about all of a sudden there's this public woman, she's in a, in a male space, and all of a sudden she just disappears. And I would love to know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, they said she went to New York. I don't know if they ran her out of town. I, I just would like to know what happened. Mm -hmm. And particularly she's there. As we know, uh, um, Boston, believe it or not, even though it's noted as one of the most racist cities here uh, up north, or as I call up south, uh, mm -hmm. it was the epicenter of the abolitionist movement. So mm -hmm. I, I'd love to know if you could find out what happened to her. And thank you, Carrie, for your book, Black Abolitionist, because I needed it to, to oh. do the tour. So. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Well, we'll put yeah. her on the list. I mean, both of, you're talking to, Caitlin and I both worked for Boston African American National Historic Site back in the early 2000s where we conducted the Black Heritage Trail, which was done through the National Park Service. And so that's where the first little, little book on Boston's abolitionists came from. But like the Mariah Stewart story is something where I, th and this gets back to kind of the genesis of the FemTor project. Um, we get into often an idea that these stories can't be discovered. And so then the myths that then surround a figure become the story that we think it is. And so one of the things we know, and, and Marilyn Richardson, who um, wrote 
a book, um, the first sort of collected edition of Mariah Stewart's work, and she's still alive, she's a wonderful historian, um, who basically resurrected and, and studies Mariah Stewart. You have Stephen Kantrowitz, who's a wonderful historian who wrote a book about Beacon Hill. So I think that, that the information about her is, start, is, is out there. And um, you know, do we know why she left Boston? I mean, there, there could be m multiple reasons why she left, but one of the things that Femtor tries to do is look at um, how are the stories that we create, the narratives that we tell about certain figures. What if Mariah Stewart um, left um, Boston because she was in a male space, but then showed up in an equally male space in New York, but then showed up in an equally male space in DC? Right? How does that then complicate our assumptions about um, black um, uh, oratory in 1830s? Yeah. Yeah. We'll put her on the list. We will. Mm -hmm. She's on the list. Pack. Mm -hmm. So uh, two questions. One, is there an online resource where we could go kind of look at like what your tour was so we can recreate it for ourselves? You give us too much credit. <laughs> 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 that is true. You do, you do give us too yes. much credit. Um, that would be a housekeeping tour we need to do very soon. So not yet. That is, but that is, that is a, on, on, um, on our list of things to do as well. OK. And, we'll, yeah, okay. Yeah. The second question was, just curious for each of you, what was kind of the most surprising thing that you took away, um, either historically or about yourselves, I guess, from the tour? Um, for me, it was uh, the story of, um, I'm going to blank on her name, the daughter of the, at the Robbins house. Oh, um, Ellen Garrison? Yeah, Ellen Garrison. Um, in particular, because her story... First of all, she is a phenomenal activist who was not only involved in um, educating freed people, um, but she also shows up in the records um, protesting the death penalty here in Massachusetts. She shows up signing petitions in support of the rights of Native Americans in um, the Plains. She's clearly, she's thinking in a, a way, in a way about oppression that is very natural now in the 21st century, but would not necessarily have been in the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, and she's also super interesting um, because after she sort of had this um, interaction in DC with her uh, case that she brings against um, uh, around sort of public accommodations for black people, uh, she actually moves uh, first to Kansas and sort of becomes part of the uh, black free, community, free black communities that were in the plains at that time. Um, and then she eventually ends up in California in the free black communities that were settled there. So her life sort of encompasses all of the lesser known stories about black life in the 19th century. Um, and she was doing these things also as an older black woman too. She moved to Kansas, I think, when she was in her 40s. And she ended up in California when she was in her 60s. Mm -hmm. um, she, it's just a revolutionary life that we don't usually um, think of in terms of someone whose life touches so many different spaces of liberation and freedom um, throughout their life um, uh, as a woman. And I think she moved to California as a, as a single older black woman. I think by that point her marriage had... Was that right? Did oh, we were just, the, the Robbins house just completed... I sit on their board and help them do the research. So we just found out that she actually was married for a second time. Okay. Um, and she and her husband moved to Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And she and her husband and her stepson um, helped try to pass um, desegregation laws in Pasadena, California. Yeah, so I mean, she's, she's fascinating to me in part because her approach to political activism reads as so modern. Um, you know, she really had a, a wide scope of understanding how all of these intersections were connected, um, or all of these oppressions, rather, were connected. Um, and then also the fact that she traveled so widely. Um, you know, I, for me, personally, I just have an interest in uh, sort of black people who were able to travel to different spaces. Um, uh, the idea of sort of the black traveler or black explorer um, is one that's becoming a little bit more um, uh, understood or, or studied, um, but finding those people, and they did exist because they wrote memoirs, we just don't necessarily republish them, but they did exist, those people who were traveling in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, um, who were sort of looking at all these different communities and, and able to move about even in these times of sort of uh, intense oppression. What's surprising? Um, uh, so one of, the, one of the episodes that we're going to do, hopefully, um, is about this black family that uh, was the only black family on the Titanic. 
<laughs> and um, and I, I just have to shout, do a shout out. I have a, a colleague who teaches at Wellesley College, and this is her one of her focuses for her next book, which is on what happened to the black family. Her name is Kelly Carter Jackson, wonderful historian, but she, and she does like black, and so she's like, what happened to the one black family that was on the Titanic? <laughs> uh, they did not make it. Um, but the, the <laughs> black newspapers, black spoiler, the black newspaper, uh, many black newspapers covered them and were really excited by the prospect of them making it. And so what um, I think what captivated my imagination and when we've talked about uh, Karen Caitlin's imaginations have been um, how, the black, how many black newspapers, once they did not make it, um, did not cover uh, them or what happened to them afterwards. And so this idea of um, the paradox of black exceptionalism and they didn't make, I mean, it's not their fault that they didn't make it. <laughs> Many people didn't make it. But um, the, the pain involved in, in that story. Um, and also the idea of uh, integrating spaces that maybe we don't need to integrate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, do we, do we um, need to be so, on the Titanic? So, like, yeah, uh, this is, you yes. know, this idea yeah. of, of um, do we want to enter into spaces that are maybe doomed and, and harmful and built, <laughs> and, and just like on a philosophical level, built specifically to harm us as black people. Well, it's like, it's like Caitlin pointed out in one of our meetings mm -hmm. was like, well, everyone's like, oh, put Harriet Tubman on the, on the $20 bill. Mm -hmm. And Caitlin was pointed out very astutely, which was why it, it, it verbalized why I always felt uncomfortable with that, which is idea like as capitalism is, is you know, erupting and harming all these different communities around the globe, and it's you know coming into question the person you put on there as a black woman is kind of like black woman will save us when everything when the ship is sinking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, black woman will be on the Titanic and then it literally sinks, or we'll we'll put Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill um, even though that twenty dollar bill represents all of this oppression that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so this whole question, I think one of the uh, the powerful things about femtor is this whole question of what does liberation actually look like? It is just look at look at putting an icon on a bill. Right, might not be the. That conversation was so. I that was a great conversation, the twenty dollar bill conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we went, we went, mm -hmm. we went places there. <laughs> <laughs> we were not we were not happy about the twenty dollar bill. And our poor little intern was like, <laughs> okay, was like, oh, okay. Should I be recording Ooh. this? Like before, mm -hmm. she's so sweet. Um, yeah. <laughs> other questions. I am the youngest of three sisters, so I am very interested in your dynamic as sisters, which now appears to be very collaborative. But was it always? <laughs> so growing up, I don't know what the age difference is between you, but I just wondered if there was the same sense of harmony that there seems to be now. Well, my mother is sitting behind me, so she could probably say, but I think I will say mm -hmm. um, that um, I think we all have the same interests, even though they manifest themselves in different choices in terms of career. I think we've always kind of had the same interests. I think one of the um, complicated things is figuring out what's your interest and what's like your, your uh, siblings' interests, right? Particularly if you're, if you're like a younger one. So Kirsten's the oldest, I'm the middle, and Caitlin's the youngest. So it's sort of figure out your, your own identity within um, that. But I think, I do think that, I mean, I, I'm just speaking for myself, I think it's, it's um, an advisor in grad school who was like, being a historian can be lonely because you're just like in your archive and then you're like, Eureka, nobody cares because it's like history, nobody cares about history, right? So this is one of those moments where when you're around uh, like-minded people, it's been a change to be bouncing ideas off of each other, also being able to trust, right, when I say something that's completely uh, just my feeling and not backed by anything, you know, the two sisters are gonna check me and say like, that's whack, that's not true. And, like, you know, you need to look into it. So I think, I think that um, is good, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, and I'm a theater person, so, uh, uh, which is a weird hybrid, because I love, I love being alone to write, but then at the end of it, you know, you're like, hey everybody, I wrote something, wanna, do, wanna, wanna get together? So I mean, even, even tonight's either. schedule, I was just like, hey everybody, did you check my schedule? <laughs> what do you think about it? And it's like, it's all right, it's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, poor Kirsten had to send us this like email that was all like, "This is at 6:05 we'll say this, at 6:10 we'll say this," and Caitlin and I were like, eh, "Well," <laughs> um, uh, and noticeably, the only person who hasn't spoken yet is is Caitlin, Caitlin. the youngest. <laughs> poor Caitlin. Yeah. I think we're learning we're learning how to work together. 
uh, I worked for a long time for, I was a nanny for a long time, and the nanny, the people I the nannied for uh, ran a, a, a documentary company. They make documentaries, make films. And they were three, four sisters. And I learned how to um, work together as a family, and they're very close. So I think, I hope, I, worked, I learned how to be sisters and work together um, a little bit from watching them for many years. I've known them now for like 20 years. Um, and learning like when to, when to push your agenda and when to back off. Mm -hmm. um, when you're spending two, like one of our tours was like two and a half weeks with some time off. But two and a half weeks to work together that closely. And also, some of us are taking some, it's a long time to work together and taking time off of our other jobs. But for like Caitlin to come and take two weeks, two and a half weeks off writing, that is a lot. So, um, you and then leaving her, her now husband, right, for two weeks, who's like, you know, has his own schedule, they have their own lives, like having asking somebody to come for like two weeks and invest in this, in this thing. Yeah. So, so it takes a lot of generosity and, and um, moving parts. And uh, um, learning how to learning how to work together, and learn and knowing that being sisters is more important than this than this uh, project. Um, uh, we legally are bound together in this project, so it's not we signed papers <laughs> legally. This project is a thing. That's not that's not what those papers said. They're not, not like we, it's not like we can't <laughs> stop working on this project. You know? No, it's, I don't. No, I don't mean I don't mean that. Yeah. I, mean, I meant like. Um, that it's formalized in a way that I think is a healthy thing. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, when we decided to do this femtor project, uh, I, should say, I should say um, after the first one, I wrote an article about it for the New York Times that went viral. There was like a lot of in uh, interest in it. Um, and uh, we knew that eventually we would want to do something like a printed book, but would probably do a podcast first. So um, I, I went to an uh, entertainment lawyer that I work with pro bono, I should add, she's very kind, um, and uh, said, what is a good way to make sure that all of our interests are represented um, and that it's very clear, um, you know, if, as, as this project progresses, what percentage of actual, you know, literal ownership um, each of us has. Um, and uh, even down to when we when a book is printed, whose name is first on the page is in that contract. So who did we decide? I think it's yours. Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So no, so no so some of know. that stuff we worked out, which has been forgotten, I guess. But no, I have, on, I have everything in my file. Yeah, so, is, yeah, yeah. is printed somewhere. There's a copy <laughs> with a with an attorney in in New York City. Um, uh, and for me, that was a very important part of moving forward in the project was making as much of this, you know, obviously as creative projects go, um, things can come up that we can't envision yet, but making as much of this as clear as possible um, in terms of who is getting credit, uh, where does ownership go, um, uh, what happens if one of us wants out of this project, what happens um, in terms of each of our agents talking to each other, all those things that can very quickly spiral into, you know, family feud. Um, we've hopefully like figured, thing. yeah, we've hopefully figured out beforehand. Ladies and gentlemen, so one last round of applause for Caitlin Carey and Kirsten Greenwich. Thank you so much. Yeah.